Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and I have a lot for you today. Um, Fantasy Mania is going to be wrapped up today because uh, for two reasons. One, I screwed up the production of Fantasy Mania Part 2, which meant that I had to remake it and uh, like remake it pretty much from scratch. So I had to reshoot that. And also, um, I had hoped to get all three parts out before WrestleMania, but my timeline was a little bit too ambitious and I got a little too busy this week. So I ultimately decided to just do, we're getting nights two and three in this video together, so you're getting that all at once. Um, you will not be getting a WrestleMania 40 preview and predictions on this channel because I already did it over on Just Alex's channel. Last night we did a live stream. Uh, it was a panel discussion with me, Alex, and uh, A&B Convos, um, and it was a fun live stream to do. I really enjoyed it. We had great discussions, and it was fun to have everybody just voice their opinions and talk about a very interesting and intriguing WrestleMania card. So uh, I, I am intrigued for this year's WrestleMania, and I plan on having a review sometime next week. Uh, along with a review, uh, an overdue review of Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire, which I am seeing Friday night. So, busy weekend coming up and a lot of stuff going on, which forced me to kind of change how I'm doing the videos. Also, in this video, you'll be getting my thoughts and feelings on the recent CM Punk interview and the backstage drama at AEW. Um, so, there is that. So, uh, yeah, before I go ahead and get started, I just want to remind everybody to like and subscribe, hit the little bell icon so you get notified when I post new videos. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, as detailed in the graphic right below. And if you want to submit questions for any, uh, for the upcoming question and answers videos that I'm going to be doing uh, after WrestleMania, you can submit those questions to the email address listed in the graphic um, below. I will also have that information in the description, so check that out. So, with all that said, before I get into the Fantasy Mania stuff, let's talk about CM Punk, um, who recently did an interview with MMA Hour and talked about some of what went down in AEW. And um, none of it was... Um, the content of what CM Punk said, none of it was really surprising, as it's a lot of stuff that I think a lot of people have suspected for a while. Um, I, I, when it comes to Punk's side of the story, I highly doubt that he was Mr. Cool, Calm, and Collected the way he's painting himself. It's like, I was professional, I did this and that. I didn't punch anybody, I just choked the guy a little bit. That stuff is like, I, I doubt that he was Mr. Cool, Calm, and Collected, you know? I, I doubt it. Uh, um, you know, I, he strikes me as a very abrasive, you know, brutally um, opinionated and uh, uh, tough person, you know, when you piss him off. It's, it's tough to cool him down. That's my impression that I get from Punk. Not saying he was wrong uh, to be upset at the things that he was upset at, but... Um, <clears throat> But I, I doubt he was Mr. Professional and Nice Guy, uh, the way he's describing it in the story. That said, um, a lot of the things that he said I absolutely agreed with. Uh, when you look at the, you know, a lot of the problems with AEW creatively that a lot of us have been saying for a while now. Um, Punk basically confirmed that, yeah, a lot of that's true, where, the, you know, they prioritize star ratings over selling tickets and making money and creating situations that'll make people want to spend their money. They're, they're just hyper obsessed with star ratings. He had a line in there where he said something to the effect of, you know, if you're ecstatic because somebody gave you four stars or five stars and the building was a quarter full, then we're not in the same business. And it's like, yeah, that, I wish more people within the industry had punk's mindset. And I think that kind of independent wrestling internet mindset has unfortunately kind of polluted the industry. And it's, it's people like punk who are the, um, the ones who have it right on the ball. And like, you know, I listened to a lot of punk's opinions on things and a lot of his, um, uh, stances on things. And I looked at the stuff that he was doing in AEW and it's like, his stuff was significantly better than most people when he wasn't hurt. Um, uh, but whenever he was on TV doing something, I could count on it at least making sense and at least being done in a way to drive a story rather than simply going out there and having a four or five star match for the sake of having a four or five star match, whatever the heck that means. But it's, um, you know, I could see punk like butting heads with the people that are the, the star rating obsessed, uh, people that, uh, just go out there and just want to do their flips and, and get all their spots in and get those, the sweet, sweet star ratings. And without any much rhyme or reason or care for what it means for the big picture and what stories are being told. And that's something I've criticized AEW for, for a long time while punk was there even. Um, and a, a lot of my suspicions about Tony Khan and the way he conducts himself as a boss, where he tries to be everybody's friend and doesn't put his foot down when he should, 
Uh, Punk basically confirmed that that's true, where he basically told Tony uh, when Jack Perry did what he did at, at Wembley. And he was like, go handle that. And he's like, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? I, I, the idea that the boss would have to have one of the boys tell him to go handle it. Like, I now, say whatever you want about Vince McMahon. If that had been Vince and one of his wrestlers had pulled something like that on his show, I believe that Vince would have probably... You wouldn't have had to tell Vince to go handle it. Vince would have gone handle it. Well, you know what? I say that, and yet he let the curtain call happen in MSG. So who knows? Like, I, I mean, Triple H got kind of punished uh for that uh you know they always talk about how severely triple h was punished for that i'm like i don't know he was intercontinental champion by the end of the year it's not like like how, how big was his punishment really and uh sean of course didn't get any blowback from it so i don't know but but i i believe that in most situations with most talents vince would have put his foot down it, like and also jack perry ain't no sean michaels so <laughs> it's um I believe he probably would have put his foot down and uh, let him know without having to have one of the boys uh, say something to him. Now, um, did Punk quit right before his match and just said, okay, let's go out there and have the match? I, again, I don't know. Um, that might be how Punk remembers it. Um, I don't know. Some of the finer details. I'd like to hear the other side of the equation just to get all that talk. Uh, he also talked about the stuff with Hangman Page, which still confuses me to this day. Like, what, uh, I remember when Hangman cut that promo, and I was like, what the fuck is he saying? It was, I, again, it was that inside baseball kind of lingo that, you know, most normal people aren't gonna get. So the whole promo just came across as confusing. And, um, yeah, I... It, the whole situation was a mess. So I, I, I don't think, I think Punk and AEW, unfortunately, was kind of like oil and water. And, you know, his wrestling philosophy didn't gel with the wrestling philosophies of the people in charge. And that created all of the problems, unfortunately. But uh, it did, I looked at the situation and the way Punk was laying it out. And I'm like, yep, that sounds pretty much what I expected from Tony Khan, where it's just like, oh, okay, let's just get along to get along. And then... And then Jack Perry goes out there and jeopardizes, you know, the biggest show ever and uh, leads to this incident that has put a black cloud over the biggest show in AEW history. And it's just like, how does something like that happen? I don't, uh, like, mm. Mm -mm -mm. And that's also part of the thing we as fans shouldn't have even known that the incident happened, quite honestly, because guys get into fights all the time back there, or at least they used to. I don't know about that anymore, but... It was like stuff like what happened between Punk and Jack Perry used to like used to be fairly commonplace back in the old days. So I don't know. It's it, it's a weird situation all around. But um, uh, but yeah, it's unfortunate that it went down the way it did, and it's unfortunate that a lot of my suspicions about Tony Khan and AEW appear to be true. If if Punk's account is completely accurate, it appears to, and I don't have any reason not to believe that the stuff about Tony Khan is true or or whatever. But um, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a messy situation. Um, even today, here we are all these months later, it's still a messy situation that AEW's never recovered from. Um, you know, the, they lost, it seems like once they lost Cody, the wheels just came off at that place. And I don't know, not that they haven't done good stuff since then, but uh, uh, maintaining momentum and upward trajectory and creating interesting storylines, um, it's been a lot more inconsistent in AEW ever since Cody left. And then the whole punk stuff went down and that is like forever tainted the brand, unfortunately. And I keep waiting for them to kind of move on past that, but they've got to put on better shows to do that. And yes, they got Mercedes Monet. Yes, they've got Will Ospreay. Yes, they've got Okada. Okay, cool. You got to put him in interesting storylines to make it work. And, and, uh, you know, it's, Right now, it's just, they're they're just, hey, we got them. It's the honeymoon period for all of them, but they haven't done anything that interesting with them yet. Not that, you know, they have to do something, you know, blow their load right off the bat, but it's, it's what their, their television product right now, which, you know, it doesn't help that they have three shows a week, which is also something I've spoken out against, but it's, um, you know, their, their product is just not very interesting. The whole devil storyline fizzled out, like that group, the Undisputed Era, or what are they called? I forget. The Undisputed Kingdom or whatever, but they're, that that's kind of fizzled out already. Wardlow already lost, which, great. <laughs> they ruined him already. So I don't, I don't know what's going on over there creatively, but they've kind of lost their way, whereas WWE is, like, coming up with more exciting things and innovative ways to present their product. The way it, the product is shot, and I made this point on the live stream last night, the way the product is shot 
and the way they've been doing segments is so much better now than it was under Vince. Like, it's it's like night and day, and it just feels more real. And it's a bunch of little changes that they made that make it feel bigger and grander, but um, it really just makes it feel more down-to-earth and gritty and real. And uh, that's a lot more engaging to watch than the paint-by-numbers, formulaic, nonsensical backstage segments that Vince did for 20 years that I always spoke out against. I'm like, this, I, I can't believe... Like, it, the presentation and the blocking and the shooting of these segments were so bad. I was like, I don't understand how people watch this every week because it is just an assault on the eyes, the ears, and all of my other senses. It's just horrible. And... Um, you know, you get Rock involved and he's finally like taking steps to fix that and bringing some of that cinematic element to WWE and making this product a lot more exciting to watch. Um, and again, through mostly little changes and his amazing performance, uh, he's done absolutely fantastic work since coming back. So it's, um, uh, we'll see how it all pays off at WrestleMania, but for right now I'm excited and AEW, like this... This Punk interview came at a, at a time where they can't afford much more bad press, but I have no reason to believe that Punk's lying either. So, uh, except for except for maybe underselling how uh, how angry he was in the moments where each one of the incidents took place. Ex except for that, um, I, I have no reason to believe that he's not telling the truth uh, in regards to Tony and everybody else that kind of picked a fight with him or whatever. But... Anyways, that is what it is. Um, so moving on from there, let's go into Fantasy Mania. Uh, like I said last week when I posted the card for night one, this is going to be a three-night card uh, that I've invented, a fantasy card made up of past WrestleMania performers. Um, the rules that I had in place were that each wrestler had to be... Um, uh, had to have worked a WrestleMania main card, so no pre-show matches, no Sunday Night Heats, no free-for-alls, none of that. They had to have worked the main cards of a WrestleMania. Um, but I could use any version of that wrestler. So if, um, I, I think the example I used, um, was, uh, uh, well, I'll use this example, Sting. Like, it's, uh, even though he only worked WrestleMania as Crow Sting, I can use him, I can use Surfer Sting if I want to. And that type of stuff. I also had the rule that none of the matches on these cards could be matches that I created previously for other fantasy cards, like my WWF WCW card or my WWF um, NWA card. Couldn't use any matches and pairings that I made up from that. That's why Undertaker and Sting is not on this card. That's the reason, because I'd already done it previously on WCW versus WWF. But um, uh, that said, I think we're good to go. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, night two, and this one I came up with some doozies for night two of this massive three-night monstrosity that I created. So, with night two kicking off with a pre-show match that I created, a WWF versus WCW encounter, D'Lo Brown versus Two Cold Scorpio. These are two guys that I was a fan of when I was a kid. Um, don't seem to be as well known now. D'Lo Brown, unfortunately, is kind of known as the guy who paralyzed draws, um, which is very unfortunate because, um, I, I don't think D'Lo was ever quite the same after that. I think maybe his confidence was shook and maybe the company's confidence in him was shook because they stopped giving him major pushes, uh, really. And, but there was a while there where it's like, I loved him as European champion. I loved the chest protector gimmick. He was, he was doing his own thing and he was, um, I loved the head bobble. I, I loved... I love D'Lo. I was a big mark for the guy. He was one of my favorite guys on the mid card. Uh, you know, he was never going to be a world champion like a Stone Cold or a Rock or anything like that. But as filling out, as far as filling out the mid card goes, I thought D'Lo did a very, very good job, and his matches were getting better and better. Uh, you know, bringing in the sky high and the low down and expanding his move set and adding more aerial moves. Like D'Lo was really developing into a very nice talent and. Uh, the match with Draws happened, and unfortunately, it seemed to be the end for both of their, um, you know, uh, careers. Draws, obviously, getting paralyzed, and D'Lo, um, it, it just seemed like they weren't interested in using him again. And that's, again, that's unfortunate, because I always liked D'Lo. And Too Cold Scorpio was a, you know, great high-flying talent that got opportunities in the WWF as Flash Funk. That's how he got onto a WrestleMania card. He was in the Tag Team Battle Royal at WrestleMania 14. And, um... Uh, you know, there was there was some potential there that just, again, never got fully realized. He had runs in a few other companies. Again, I first saw him in WCW, and there was talent there. There was definitely talent there. He was a unique in-ring talent that, um, again, just never seemed to click on a grand scale uh, beyond um, having a few good matches here and there. So this match is created to give these two underrated talents a chance to shine. 
D'Lo Brown versus Two Cold Scorpio in a uh, an athletic, high flying affair. Uh, where I would have D'Lo go over because I love again. I was more of a mark for D'Lo, but I think this would have been a really cool match. And had I uh, had I thought about it, I probably should have added it to my WWF versus WCW card a few years ago. I didn't, but I added it here, and uh, it should be a fun match. All right, next up, we're bringing in the cruiserweight. So uh, in trying to create the ultimate cruiserweight match, I thought about what if I bring in, um, uh, you know, when because when you think of cruiserweights, you think of WCW, obviously. And you think of Lucha Libre. And I thought, okay, so Rey Mysterio has to be in this match. Like, whatever I do with the cruiserweight title uh, on this dream card, Rey Mysterio has to be on there. But then I also thought about... Uh, Japanese light heavyweight divisions um, like New Japan's and I thought about TNA's X division which kind of took what WCW would establish with the cruiserweight division and then brought it to the next level by making the X division a vital part of their program so I thought it's like okay so this is going to be WCW cruiserweight division versus New Japan light heavyweight division versus TNA X division and the match I ultimately cooked up for the ultimate cruiserweight championship Rey Mysterio Jr versus Takamichi Noku, versus the phenomenal AJ Styles, the mid-2000s AJ that I first knew and loved, who was like the ultimate X Division competitor. I would have AJ win this match because I was, again, big mark for AJ Styles and Ultimate X. Um, he won a couple of those. Uh, he won the uh, what I feel is the best Ultimate X match, the one at Final Resolution 2005. And, uh, you know, uh, Takamichi Noku, former light heavyweight champion with the WWF, um, the division that wasn't as good as WCW's Cruiserweight division, but he still left a mark on the WWF and was a champion during a very hot period um, of WWF programming. And I was like, yeah, this could be a really exciting match to showcase the Cruiserweights. And an opening match tonight, too, is you start with the high wire spectacle, you do the Ultimate X match. So uh, this is uh, my choice for the main card opener. Now, as sort of a cool down from the opener, we have a big women's battle royal. There's two battle royals on night two. Um, I apologize for that. But um, the um, one of my biggest disappointments of WrestleMania 25 was the Miss WrestleMania battle royal. Not that I expect a battle royal to be a great match or anything, but I thought it was cool how they said we're going to bring in all these past girls uh, to have like this ultimate women's battle royal. It's like, oh, it would be cool to see who they got. And then you get to the match, and they cut out the entrances to do like an entr a big entrance, group entrance with uh, with Kid Rock, and I didn't know who was in it. It was just a very horribly put together and very disappointing. And it was all done for a joke, just to put Santina Morella um, in there, and it, the whole thing just became became a farce. What could have been like a pretty cool attraction uh, kind of got ruined. Now, in the interest of doing the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal correctly, here's a rundown of all of my participants for this 25-woman Battle Royal spanning across different decades and different eras. I've got Rhea Ripley, AJ Lee, Sable, uh, Tori Wilson, Ivory, Fabulous Moolah, Ronda Rousey, Melina, Paige, Michelle McCool, Nikki Cross, Carmella, Chelsea Green, Emma, Naomi, Eve Torres, Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, Dana Brooke, Mandy Rose, Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax, Velvet McIntyre, Jackie Gaeta, and Stacey Keebler. Again, you get some divas in there, you get some old legends in there, you get um, Attitude Era women in there, you get uh, some of the modern women in there. It's a nice collection of uh, old and new, all put together for a Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal. I would have Rhea Ripley win it. I've kind of designed the whole thing to be like, Rhea just tosses bitches out left and right and gets a huge win. So that's kind of what I did there. But, um... Uh, would be fun, and it'd be nice to see this battle royal done correctly. So that's my take on that. Now, this next match I've cooked up is not really cross generational. It's all '80s guys, but it was done for the purpose of giving a little bit of a spotlight to the Heenan family, which was really the first stable that I remember seeing. And I loved Bobby Heenan so much that uh, I love that he was attached to so many different guys that were icons of this era. So what I've designed here is a triple threat match to determine who is the crown jewel of the Heenan family because there were three guys that Heenan managed that were kind of like, aside from Andre, and Andre was kind of in a class all of his own, but there were three guys that Heenan managed that were uh, seen as like his ultimate crown jewel type of guys. You had Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, who was a perfect rival for the immortal Hulk Hogan. You had Ravishing Rick Rude, who was the first man to defeat the ultimate warrior uh, for, for a championship and was a huge, huge star uh, that... Bobby Heenan worked with, and you had, of course, Kurt Hennig, Mr. Perfect, the man with the undefeated streak and one of the greatest intercontinental champions of all time. So three great talents put together in one match to determine who is 
the true crown jewel of the Heenan family. Uh, Heenan would be in a neutral corner uh, based on my own design and watch as all of his top prospects fight each other. Uh, this match was also inspired by the Haku Harley race match, Battle for the Crown, that was at the uh, 1989 Royal Rumble, where Heenan was trying to play both sides <laughs> as far as determining who he was ultimately going to side with because he managed both men. And this is kind of like taking that to the next level where there's three guys that Heenan is invested in that he would be... Uh, uh, that he would be uh, offering a service to uh, to decide who's going to be his ultimate prize in this match. So uh, I also think Mr. Perfect, Rick Rude, and Paul Orndorff, all great workers, all great talents, all, uh, you, know, you know, great icons of that era of wrestling, the 1980s, you know, the mid to late 80s to early 90s. All three of them played big roles during that time period. And I just think this would be a really fun match to watch. And next up is a bit of a crazy one, a, a gimmick match that I cooked up, the Lion's Den match. Uh, now, Ken Shamrock had a series of Lion's Den matches while he was in the WWE. Uh, the best one that he had was with Owen Hart at SummerSlam 1998. I highly recommend checking that match out. That was a very fun match to watch. But uh, if you want to see Ken Shamrock go up against in, in a shoot fight style of match... Um, one idea that I have is to put him up against the guy with a reputation unlike any other, and that is... King Tonga himself, Haku. Haku's status as the toughest man in pro wrestling is legendary. And I just kind of love the idea of watching him and Ken Shamrock beat the holy hell out of each other because that could be fun to watch. Um, I have seen Haku or Ming or, you know, to use another name that he had. Um, I have watched him have some pretty cool matches. He had a match with the Giant on an episode of Nitro where he just... Total stiff fest, but it's so much fun to watch and a great match. And I think if Haku could bring that element into the lion's den with Ken Shamrock, it could make for a really, really fun match. And also, I, I booked this to kind of, again, capitalize on the fact that Haku is, has become such a notorious, you know, tough guy uh, among the stories and uh, that the boys have told over the years. Um, I just think this would be a really fun one to have two of the legit tough guys in wrestling history go at it in a kind of a no-holds-barred environment. It could be a lot of fun. Now, I have to explain this next match. It's a Survivor Series rules match, four on four, some of the greatest tag teams of all time. The Legion of Doom and Demolition, Axe and Smash, specifically that pairing, going up against the Dudley Boys and the Usos, Jimmy and Jay. Now, uh, this match is for what I have called the Survivor Series Championship, and I feel like I have to explain that because there is some backstory here. When I was a kid, playing with the old Hasbro WWF action figures, uh, I got a little uh, crazy with some of the cards that I booked. I invented championships, and I also took those Hasbro WWF figures and I crossed them over with um, other action figure toy lines, the ones that were comparable size to the WWF Hasbro figures. And some of those toy lines included uh, Masters of the Universe, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Playmates toy line, the originals, uh, also the Dick Tracy toy line, also from Playmates, and also I think I've worked Bucky O'Hare in there as well. And so with all these different characters all working all these different fantasy matches together, um, I created some different championships. My personal favorite that I created was the Survivor Series Championship, which were four-man or five-man titles defended under Survivor, Survivor Series rules. The way I had it set up was that each four-man team could select a sometimes fifth partner if the titles were defended under five versus five rules. So, for example, one of the teams that I cooked up was a team called Large and In Charge. It was the Natural Disasters, Earthquake, and Typhoon, teamed up with the Twin Towers, Akeem and the Big Boss Man, and their sometimes fifth partner was Yokozuna. Um, so I created like a full division of teams to uh, fight in this Survivor Series championship. Uh, I remember I took Big Boy's uh, gangs from the Dick, his gang members from the Dick Tracy movie. It was like Big Boy, Flat Top, Itchy, and Prune Face. Uh, and they were called like Crooks and... Uh, Crooks and uh, Gangsters and Crooks or something like that. I forget what the name was, but uh, I had that as a group. Um, I had like the Evil Alliance, which was like Skeletor, Hordak, uh, Shredder. Um, I might have put Million Dollar Man in there uh, <laughs> as the benefactor of this Evil Alliance or something like that. So uh, I had a lot of fun with the Survivor Series Championship, but I created the title specifically for two teams that I cooked up. Um, obviously one of them is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Raphael, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, 
Leonardo, Donatello, and Casey Jones as their sometimes fifth partner. And the other team I cooked up was Hawk and Animal, the Legion of Doom, teamed up with Axe and Smash with Crush as the sometimes fifth partner. So I am resurrecting that old boyhood stupid, ridiculous childhood concept of the Survivor Series Championship, and I'm bringing it back for this fa fantasy card where Hawk and Animal and Axe and Smash defend the Survivor Series Championship against the Dudley Boys and the Usos. And this was also a way to get extra tag teams on the show and show my appreciation for tag team wrestling. I, it's hard to believe for me, who's somebody who cries about, like, stop it with the championships, there's too many titles. You'd be surprised to know that I actually came up with an eight-man tag team championship uh, when I played with the toys as a kid. So, eh, what are you going to do? I'm a hypocrite. But in any case, um, I would have... LOD and Demolition win this match because I loved both of those teams as a kid. The face-painted warriors that destroyed everybody. I loved LOD. I loved Demolition. I always felt like Demolition got a bad rap, so this match is my way of like giving them a significant spot on the show and having some fun with it as well. So I would definitely have LOD and Demolition go over here in what should be a really, really fun match involving four great teams. And we go from one crazy concept to another. This is the most Russo-rific thing I think I've ever booked, but it's something that I, you know, there's a lot of weird and wacky characters out there in wrestling's history, and I thought, hey, let's give them a showcase and let them uh, let them have a grand stage to uh, you know, show off what they got and what made those characters so special. So I have devised something called the Halloween Havoc Match, um, where it's the Big Red Machine Kane, specifically 97, 98 Kane, the best Kane, uh, going up against The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, um, The Demon, Finn Balor, and the French-Canadian Frankenstein, PCO. Now, you might be thinking, PCO never worked WrestleMania. Yes, he did. As a member of the Quebecers, he worked WrestleMania's 10 and 14 in the Tag Team Battle Royal. He was in the tag title match at WrestleMania 10 as well. So, um, so yes, I can use, because Pierre had worked those previous WrestleManias, I can use PCO uh, for my little fantasy card here. So what is the Halloween Havoc match? It is a match. Three falls. Four way. It's a four way elimination. And um, each match begins with a stipulation that is determined by the Halloween Havoc spin the wheel make the deal. So I, I even cooked it up. So uh, you have all the match options um, on the wheel. Uh, you've got casket match, body bag match, spinner's choice. Concrete Crip match, the Blindfold match, Boiler Room Brawl match, Ambulance match, King of the Road match, which was one of my personal favorites as a kid, and the Texas Death match. And, um, and uh, those were the ones I used to fill out the wheel. Uh, the ones that I would have get picked, because again, it's my fantasy and I can cook up whatever gimmick I want. First fall is the Monster's Ball, which is a TNA special, but a super hardcore free-for-all uh, that can start backstage, work its way out into the arena, and they can do all sorts of things with it. I also had the idea of like having other characters pop up during this. Like You can get a cameo from the Boogeyman. You can get a cameo from... Um, uh, some of the other wacky, spooky characters, like maybe Gold Dust or, or something like that. Um, th so that was another another weird idea I had. But uh, Monsters Ball, and then once somebody is pinned, then that person gets to spin the wheel next and determine the next gimmick. So let's say Finn Balor gets eliminated in the first round in the Monsters Ball, and then it turns into a buried alive match. That's where PCO gets eliminated, where he gets buried, and then. Um, the final fall is an inferno match between the Fiend Bray Wyatt and the Big Red Machine Kane. Uh, the Fiend wins by setting Kane on fire, and you get um, Bray Wyatt's ultimate victory in this really weird psychotic match that I cooked up. I don't know how this would play on TV, <laughs> but uh, I let my imagination run wild with this one. Now, you might also be thinking, it's like, hey, WrestleMania is in April and Halloween's in, in October. You can't have a halloween theme match in October, to which I say... Shut up. It's my fantasy card and I'll do whatever I want. It's a it's a it's entertainment, bro. I'll do what I want. Uh so yeah, the Halloween Havoc match. That's that's probably the nuttiest idea I cooked. Alright, and the next match I cooked up is a bit of a filler, more of a comedy match where I took all of the comedy characters, put them together in a 10-man tag, and just let them burn up some time and, and get some laughs out of the crowd. It's kind of a popcorn match. Uh, I have the Junkyard Dog, George the Animal Steel, the Gobbledygooker, who did work a match at WrestleMania. He was in the Battle Royal at 17. Uh, the Hurricane, and who worked uh, the hard... He uh, was one of the participants in the 24-7 nonsense at WrestleMania 18, so I feel like that's enough to count. 
And Santino Morella, who, as I already stated, won the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal and had a couple other Mania matches as well. And they would be taking on more comedic group of heels led by Dirty Dominic Mysterio uh, with partners Dangerous Danny Davis, the evil referee who worked a match at WrestleMania 3, and, of course, some of my favorites, the Mean Street Posse, Rodney, Pete Gass, and Joey Abs. Uh, they were in the hardcore title Battle Royal at 2000, uh, making them uh, eligible to be on my fantasy card. And really, I just wanted to cook up a team of heels that were fun to watch get beat up, which is what the Mean Street Posse was, was which is what Dirty Dom is, which is what Danny Davis was back in the day. So I thought... Uh, putting them together with some of the more comedic baby faces like the Junkyard Dogs who can headbutt them all over the place or George the Animal Steel who could eat the turnbuckle pad and throw the stuffing in their face or Gobbly Gooker who could do a dance with them and, and drop kick them or do something silly or uh, Hurricane Helms who can sh choke slam one of them or something silly and Santina Morella could do the Cobra and all sorts of silliness there. Uh, a lot of potential for just comedy, haha, gaga nonsense. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, just eat up a few minutes and have some fun. Let the baby faces go over. Simple match, but, uh, you know, as I've said before, those popcorn matches are actually more important than people realize. And, uh, I wanted to get at least one of those on this card. And now we're getting into the more hardcore side of things with one of the big, uh, singles matches that I cooked up for this card. The dog collar match between the two kings of the dog collar matches. The originator of the match, Rowdy Roddy Piper, taking on CM Punk, the man who brought the dog collar match into the modern age with his matches in Ring of Honor and AEW. And, uh, yeah, just let these two mercs with the mouths, you know, uh, have excellent promos and barbs against each other in the lead up to it. And then come match time, they just beat the holy hell out of each other with a chain and have all sorts of fun with it. So, uh, to me, this was one that I cooked up pretty easily. And I thought was like a, a natural to put these two together because they're known for talking and they're also known for a dog collar match. And I wanted to get like kind of a hardcore match on the show. I mean, I guess I already did the Halloween Havoc match, but something that's more of a, more of a blood and gut style blood feud kind of hardcore match rather than kind of the the spectacle hardcore match that you would see in the Halloween Havoc match and um yeah I think this could be a really fun match and one that I would really enjoy I have more of an affection for Piper so I would have him go over but uh still this is a um a really really uh fun idea that I had and one that I'm glad to put on this card and we go from hardcore to pure wrestling a technical wrestling Dream come true, the ultimate mat wrestling technical work rate dream match, the ultimate submission match, Brett the Hitman Hart versus the Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. I don't need to say anything about this match. Everybody wants this match. Everybody wants to see this match. It's the two greatest technical wrestlers of all time doing what they do best in an absolute showcase of wrestling ability and um, excellent, excellent excellent athleticism from two guys that could absolutely get it done. It would be fun to watch them counter each other's submissions. It would be fun to watch uh, Kurt Angle counter the sharpshooter into the ankle lock and vice versa. I could see, I could actually picture it in my head, both of them going down. It would be fun to watch uh, Kurt Angle suplex Bret Hart all over the place. It would be fun to watch Bret Hart um, come up with some of his, uh, you know, playing possum tricks to kind of lure Kurt into a false sense of security and then try to pick up a, you know, roll him up into some kind of a submission hold out of that because Brett was known for doing that type of stuff. I think this would be an excellent match and I think these two, uh, if they met each other in their primes, they could have had an excellent, excellent match together. So this one was a no-brainer for me to put on here. And we go from wrestling uh, excellence to pure drama. I'm a drama vampire. We all love drama. We all love uh, personal warfare. It's why reality shows are such a big deal. We just love watching people throw all their shit and their dirty laundry out in the public and people just eat that stuff up like crazy. So what is the ultimate match to do in that regard? I would say Stephanie McMahon versus the ninth wonder of the world, China. Uh, we all know the history there. We all know the backstory and uh, the personal conflict there. And, you know, I thought about doing China versus Rhea Ripley as like a battle of the bulls, but a woman's version of that. But instead I decided to Aaron's like, okay, what's the match? It, like if China uh, could come back, now, if that were a possibility, what's the match that everybody would want to see her have upon her return? It would be, they would want to see her destroy Stephanie McMahon, right? That's what everybody would want because everybody has their perception of the story and how everything went down with Triple H, you know, cheating on her with Steph and, and Steph, the perception being that Steph stole uh, Triple H from China or whatever. And uh, the way that the WWE handled China, uh, 
uh, post her departure from the company and all sorts of other things. So, um, uh, to me, the storyline writes itself. And you do the match. It's like, just have China destroy her. Like, it's just power bomb her, like, two or three times and get the win. It doesn't have to be the most technical uh, showcase ever. It just has to be, like, a satisfying payoff to a, a drama and a storyline that started off real and could spill out onto TV and, you know, make some money with it. So, uh, this one, uh, you know, kind of a fun one to do for me. And next up is a match that I was so excited about. I dare say it was the match that kind of inspired me to create this entire Fantasy Mania thing. Like, uh, it was kind of the match that um, made me want to put these cards together. Because I thought about this pairing and I was like, man, this is a no-brainer. This would be awesome. It would be the ultimate heavyweight matchup. Brock Lesnar, the Beast Incarnate, versus Big Van Vader, the Mastodon, the Killer... The man who ran through WCW and destroyed all of the heroes and beat everybody up and won the title and was one of the most dominant heavyweights of all time. You get like 92 Vader in there with 2010's Brock Lesnar. It would be awesome because they would throw each other around. They would be stiff as hell. It would be like watching two bulls charge at each other and you'd have Vader doing the moonsault and all sorts of other things. Would be a very, very exciting match to do. And of course the finish... Lesnar has to deliver the F5 to that 450-pound monster to get the win, but this would be a very hard-hitting, exciting heavyweight match. And again, it was when I thought about this match, that kind of inspired me to create this dream card because it was just, it's such an awesome match to think about. And I, uh, it's, I mean, this is a dream match for me in every sense of the word. And next up, I have another Battle Royal, this time a, what I've called the Land of the Giants Battle Royal, a 20-man Battle Royal featuring tall guys, Big guys, super heavyweights, all of those larger-than-life icons put into one match in one ring to determine who is the king of the giants. So uh, my 20 participants are Kevin Nash, Yokozuna, Big John Studd, King Kong Bundy, The Big Show, Mark Henry, Braun Strowman, Omos, Omos, or whatever his name is, Viscera, Rikishi, Kamala, the Ugandan giant, The Beast from the East, Bam Bam Bigelow, Earthquake, Typhoon, The One Man Gang, Giant Gonzalez, Sid Vicious, the Great Kali, Shaquille O'Neal, and William the Refrigerator Perry, the latter two who were celebrity participants who actually did work Battle Royals in WrestleMania's history. So, um, yeah, I think this is, the, you know, the Where's the Beef match where it's just a bunch of big guys slapping meat and tossing each other out of the ring. Um, no, you, nobody was, would expect a lot of technical ability from this match, but it could be fun to see who is the top giant in wrestling based on this. Now, you might be wondering, it's like, where are some of the other giants? Where's Andre the Giant? Where's, um, you know, a couple of other ones? Well, uh, stay tuned for more because I have other matches to go through. But as far as who wins this battle royal, I I'm leaning on Earthquake because I've always had a soft spot for Earthquake. And I know he just had the episode of Dark Side of the Ring, but um, I, I would be leaning towards Earthquake even if that episode wasn't made because I've just, I've just always liked Earthquake. And it would be cool to see him win a battle royal at a big card like this. So that's my pick. And next up, it's more family drama, a tornado tag team match, the Rhodes versus the McMahons. Dusty Rhodes, Dustin Rhodes, and of course the American Nightmare, uh, Cody Rhodes taking on Vince McMahon, Shane McMahon. And I needed another person to put with Vince and Shane, so I ultimately sided with the big boss man because uh, he was their security guard for a while during the Attitude Era and just seemed like the best fit. He also had a feud with Dusty back in 89, so that also kind of made him fit. So, um, yeah, this could be fun because it's just, uh, you've got so many fun characters in a kind of a no-rules environment and they could do all sorts of silly and crazy things. I'm picturing Shane McMahon getting crossroads through the announce table or something silly like that. You've got uh, Gold Dust, Dustin, and the big boss man who are kind of the brutes in the situation. Uh, you got Cody and Shane who are kind of the more athletic ones. And you got Dusty and Vince who are the larger-than-life personalities that you want to see uh, cross paths with each other. And the idea of uh, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, getting fucking like a monkey in public, if you will. Uh, doing the bionic elbow on Vince McMahon is just too sweet to pass up. So, uh, yeah, I set up this match. The Rhodes would go over, obviously. I wouldn't even consider having the McMahons go over in this fantasy scenario that I invented. So, uh, yeah, Rhodes versus McMahons. This one could be a lot of fun. And finally, we have the main event of Night 2, a steel cage match between the Battle of the Long Reigning Champions. So I got the living legend Bruno San Martino, who did have a WrestleMania match. He was in the... Uh, Battle Royal, the NFL w uh, the NFL WWF Battle Royal from WrestleMania 2. So that's Bruno San Martino 
taking on Roman Reigns, the tribal chief, uh, the longest reigning champion uh, since the turn of the century. Uh, that guy going up against the longest reigning WWF champion of all time. So, uh, you know, seemed logical to put them together. I feel like Battle of the Growing Legacy, uh, the, the growing legacy versus the established legacy, the untouchable legacy that no one will ever surpass. Um, that is uh, that, that was intriguing to me. And Bruno was also kind of known for the steel cage match, mainly through his uh, his feud with Larry Zbysko and their big match at the showdown at Shea. Uh, so this seemed like a natural match to do. Uh, again, Battle of the Legacies type of deal and a perfectly acceptable main event for night two, I think. And let's wrap up night three of Fantasy Mania, wrap up the entirety of this insane fantasy card that I put together. Uh, night three starts off with a pre-show match of my own design. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of tag team wrestling. I love tag teams. And so I created kind of the ultimate tribute to tag team wrestling. The ultimate four corners tag team turmoil match where the entire match, it's four teams in a four corner situation, elimination rules. Every time a team is eliminated, a new team joins the fray and it cycles through until there's only one team remaining. Uh, in total, I have 30 teams. I went a little too far with this, but there were a lot of tag teams I wanted to get on the show. So, um, uh, looking over it, um... The participating teams are the Dream Team, Dino Bravo and Greg Valentine, the Million Dollar Corporation, Tatanka, and the Underfaker, also known as Brian Lee or Chains. Uh, some of these teams existed and some of these teams are made up by me, so keep that in mind. Um, the Killer Bees, be Brian Blair and Jumping Jim Brunzel, Power and Glory, Hercules and Paul Roma, the Fabulous Rougeau Brothers, the Powers of Pain, Warlord and Barbarian, The Bushwhackers, Luke and Butch, The Orient, the Orient Express, Pat Tanaka, and either, uh, I think it was Kato was the one that worked WrestleMania 6, so it would be that one, that version of The Orient Express. Uh, the Nasty Boys, Knobs and, the, the Nasty Boys, uh, Knobs and Sags. Uh, Chronic, uh, the, the Brian team from WCW, both of them worked WrestleMania in the past, so I can use Chronic in there. Unfortunately, I could not use Harlem Heat, but I found something else to do with Booker T, but Stevie Ray never worked WrestleMania, so I couldn't put Harlem Heat in this, which was a shame. FTR never worked a main WrestleMania card, so I couldn't use the Revival or FTR either, which, uh, also a shame. I probably would have put FTR in the, um, in the Survivor Series Championship match on night two, but, eh, whatever. Um, okay, after Chronic, we have the Rock and Roll Express, who did work a Mania match. They were in the Tag Team Battle Royal at 14. Uh, the Headbangers, Mosh and Thrasher, Too Cool, Grandmaster Sexay, and Scotty Too Hotty. The Disciples of Apocalypse, Ron and Don Harris, or Eight Ball and Skull. Uh, the Godwins, Phineas and Henry. Uh, the New Age Outlaws, uh, Billy Gunn and, uh, Road Dog Jesse James, probably the biggest team in this match. Uh, the FBI, Nunzio and Chuck Palumbo. La Resistance, Rene Dupree and uh, Robert Robert Conway. Uh, the Bashams, Doug and Danny. The New Day, specifically Big E and Xavier Woods. Um, I have other plans for Kofi Kingston, which is why he's not in this. Uh, the Fashion Police, Tyler Breeze and Fandango. Or Fandango. Uh, the Primetime Players, Titus O'Neil and Darren Young. The Wyatt Family, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. Uh, the Good Brothers, The Club, whatever you want to call them, uh, Gallows and Anderson. The Alpha Academy, Chad Gable and Otis. The Street Profits, The Viking Raiders, Bob Orton and Don Morocco, who were a tag team. They worked together at WrestleMania 3. The Awesome Truth, Miz and, and Ron Killings, or R-Truth. Uh, and The Hollies, Hardcore and Crash. Boy, that is a lot. That is a big, big pre-show match. Kind of like my version of the New Japan Rumble. Just an excuse to get a bunch of guys on there and uh, have a really fun match filled with varying different styles of tag teams from um work rate guys to big bruisers to comedy teams and everything in between so uh, I, I think this would make for just a really fun pre-show match and a good way to get additional guys on this fantasy card that i cooked up so um next up is the official opener of night three and i decided to have one of the three night openers i wanted to be a battle of the wrestlemania opening talent so i cooked up this 10-man tag yeah another 10-man tag of People who opened up WrestleMania in the past. So one team, it's Finley who opened up WrestleMania's 23, 24, and 25, at least, possibly more, but at least those three. Uh, Bobby Lashley, who opened up WrestleMania 37, night one. Tito Santana, who, re who opened up uh, WrestleMania 8 and had the first ever match in WrestleMania history when he opened up WrestleMania 1. 
Um, Riddle, or Matt Riddle, who opened up uh, night two of WrestleMania 38. And Ahmed Johnson, who opened up WrestleMania 12. And they would be facing the team of William Regal, who opened up WrestleMania 17 and 18. Uh, Sheamus, who opened up WrestleMania's 28 and 29, possibly more, but at least those two. Um, Drew McIntyre, who opened up WrestleMania 37 night one. Um, Bad News Brown, who won the opening Battle Royal at WrestleMania 4. And Chris Masters, who opened up WrestleMania 22. Um, this is just a fun match to kind of get some bodies on there, get some talents involved, and uh, have some fun with it. And I filled it mostly with kind of bruiser type of guys who could have like a more of a hard-hitting style. So you get like a little bit of smash mouth in the opening match. And uh, yeah, would, would just be a fun match, a fun mix of talents, generational talents. And uh, it'd be fun. I mean, Ahmed's not a, probably the weakest worker of the bunch out of those 10, but you know, he showed at WrestleMania 12 is like you surround him with talent. He can be in a good match. So uh, I see no reason why that wouldn't be the same thing here. So yeah, this was just something I cooked up just to have some fun and reference WrestleMania's history with all the opening matches. Uh, next up is uh, a match that I would be very excited to see. The DDT match. Who is the master of the DDT? And this match would determine would only end when one of the participants hits the DDT. It's the only way you can win. And that is the two masters of the DDT, uh, the Lord of the Evenflow DDT, Raven, taking on the creator of the DDT, Jake the Snake Roberts. Uh, the promos for this match would be amazing. I think both guys are fun, creepy characters that um, would would have worked amazingly well together. And then you have a ready-made gimmick because they both use the DDT as a finisher, and uh, I think it would be great. I would have Jake go over because I, I'm more of a fan of Jake, but because um, he was, you know, he was around when I first started watching, so I have more of a nostalgia factor for him. But both talents are great, both talents are wonderful, and I would uh, I would love to see this match. Next up is a Ultimate Women's Tag Team Championship match, a fatal four-way. So women's tag team titles, they exist now in the modern age. Uh, they were around when I first started watching, but they were barely used. Um, the Jumping Bomb Angels were obviously the main reason that there was a, uh, a women's tag team championship. But uh, here I was like, okay, let's use the tag team titles and use it as a way to also present more generational talents. And three, two, one. Next up is a match for the Ultimate Women's Tag Team Championship. Uh, the Women's Tag Team Championship is a more modern title. There was one when I was a kid and first started watching, but uh, outside of the Glamour Girls and the Jumping Bomb Angels, there wasn't much of a division to speak of. And I also use this match as an opportunity to highlight some of the great talents across different eras. So, uh, I cooked up a fatal four-way match for these belts involving the Attitude Era Girls, Trish Stratus and Lita as one team, uh, the Classic Era Girls, uh, Lundra Blaze and Wendy Richter as another team, um, the Boston Hug Connection, the only defined tag team here, uh, Sasha and Bailey, Sasha Banks and Bailey, I should say. And I'm going to go a little TNA here, the TNA Knockouts, Mickey James and Gail Kim. So uh, I think this would be a great little tag team four-way involving so many great talents that are, have such great reputations. I think these eight could combine and make a, for a really good match together. Um, who would go over? I mean... I, I would go with the knockouts because I'm kind of partial to Mickey and Gale, but uh, that's just me. Whatever. It's It doesn't really matter. It's just a really fun match to think about. Next up is a battle of the European Juggernauts, a battle that I determined would be for the both the United States and the European Championships. Possibly as a two-fall match similar to the three-way match at WrestleMania 2000. I don't know. But uh, it's a match between Gunther, or Walter, whichever name you want to use, and Claudio Castagnoli. That name I will use. I will not go by Cesaro because Claudio is a better name. But um, yeah, these two are freaks they are freakishly strong they are great athletes and they have imposing figures and um uh, impressive power moves uh, to use against each other so i think putting these two together would be a hell of a match and be a bit of a dark horse on uh this dream fantasy card of mine so uh yeah i said i say let these two bulls go at each other and have uh have a match that tears the house down Next up is for the Women's Championship, uh, a match, uh, this is another one of those matches that I thought about when putting the fantasy card together and was like, yeah, I should do this because I've always been partial to Luna Vachon. And she should have won the Women's Championship. She should have gone into the Hall of Fame in her own induction instead of them sneaking her in in that stupid legacy induction thing that they did with her and Lord Alfred Hayes and all those other talents. I thought that was ridiculous. I think if you're going into the hall, you should get your own induction. I think grouping them all together and putting them in like that was stupid. Um, I, I 
I don't know what it is with Luna. Like they just never treated her right. I understand she was a bit hard to deal with, but an amazing talent, amazing character that deserved her due. So here I am, women's championship, the ultimate women's championship, going up against the man Becky Lynch, uh, you know, the, one of the first women to main event WrestleMania, going up against one of the most underrated female talents of all time in Luna Vachon. Let him have a street fight. Let it be no holds barred. Let him go at each other, tear the house down. Luna Vachon wins the Ultimate Women's Championship going over Becky Lynch and giving her the crowning moment that she so richly deserves. Now, if you know me, this match might surprise you. I am not a fan of the multi-person ladder matches, but you know what? It's a fantasy card, and I'm trying to create, like, the ultimate versions of certain matches, so... If we're going to do a multi-person car wreck ladder match, let's do it right and get the right talents involved. So, the Ultimate Money in the Bank ladder match... Uh, the Dirty Dozen ladder match, as I called it, because it's 12 participants. Again, I've, I'm a hypocrite. Whatever. I, I, I needed to figure out something to do with some of these guys, because they are great talents and deserve to be on this card. And this seemed to be the best way to do it uh, in this fantasy scenario of mine. But uh, Ultimate Money in the Bank ladder match, I filled it with ladder match specialists. So Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Edge, Christian, X-Pac, who had a ladder match against um, uh, Eddie Guerrero in WCW. That was quite good, but very underrated. Uh, Rob Van Dam, Razor Ramon, the one of the architects of the ladder match, uh, Shelton Benjamin, who was like the king of money in the bank for a while, John Morrison, Dolph Ziggler, Kofi Kingston, I told you I had a plan for Kofi, and a bit of a dark horse here, but Superfly Jimmy Snuka, uh, who was never in a ladder match to my knowledge, but was known as a high flyer and would have been perfect for this type of setting. So uh, I would have Razor win because I'm a big Scott Hall fan, uh, but... In any case, this is, uh, this is, again, it's just the ultimate money in the bank ladder match. So if you got to have one of these type of ladder matches, put it, fill it with the talents that could make it really special. And I think these 12 guys could do it. Next up is the match for the ultimate tag team championship. The Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott versus the British Bulldogs, Davey Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid. Now, um... I, I talked about it with Vader and Brock, how that was a match where I thought about it. It was like, man, and it kind of inspired me to do this whole fantasy card thing. This is the other match that did that because I, I think what we're looking at right here, if I had to list my top five favorite tag teams of all time, both of these teams would be on there. The Steiner brothers in particular are a candidate for number one all time. I love these tag teams. I love... Um, uh, you know, the wide variety of styles that they represent. Dynamite's the high flyer. Davey Boy's the power guy. Uh, Rick is more of the down and dirty brawler. He could wrestle, but he's more of the down and dirty brawler, while Scott Steiner is the freakish athlete. I mean, go back and watch young Scott Steiner. He was like Kurt Angle. He was like Kurt Angle before there was Kurt Angle. He was an amazing, amazing wrestler. Um, and the Steiner brothers were uh, the best tag team around during the time when they were at their peak. And the idea of mixing them together with Davey Boy and the Dynamite Kid, I think they could have torn the house down and had, like, one of the greatest tag team matches of all time. That's one I think about. You want to talk about dream matches, that's a dream match for me. The Bulldogs versus the Steiners, I think, would be amazing. Um, I would have the Steiners go over because I'm more partial to them, but this would be an amazing, amazing match. And I would. this is one I would throw my money at, and I would absolutely pay to see it. This next match is a little convoluted. I wasn't quite sure how to do it, but... Um, uh, I, I think uh, like an eight-man battle bowl uh, is kind of what I settled on, like a version, like a watered-down version of the battle bowl. Some kind of an elimination match format uh, involving these eight guys for what I call the ultimate WCW championship. So I took a bunch of wrestlers who had worked in WCW and I said, okay, they have to have had at held at least two WCW championships during their tenures in WCW to qualify for this match. So the eight participants are... Diamond Dallas Page, former WCW, United States television and tag team champion. Ron Simmons, vor former WCW champion and tag team champion as a member of Doom. Perry Saturn, former TV champion and tag team champion with Raven. Dean Malenko, former television champion, cruiserweight champion, arguably, arguably the best cruiserweight champion. It's either him or Chris Jericho. Uh, and former tag team champion. Um, Chris Benoit, former WCW World Champion, United States Champion, Television Champion, and Tag Team Champion. Lex Luger, former World Heavyweight Champion, arguably the greatest United States Champion in company history, and former Tag Team Champion along with Sting. 
Chris Jericho, former Cruiserweight Champion and former Television Champion, and of course, Booker T, former World Heavyweight Champion, five-time, 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 five-time WCW Champion, former United States Champion, former Television Champion, and former Tag Team Champion. Booker T is also, in my opinion, the last WCW Champion, because any title changes that took place in the WWE during the Invasion Angle... In my mind, like they officially count, but in my mind, I've completely divorced from that, and I just pretend that that didn't happen, because to me, Booker T is the final WCW champion. But this match is designed to crown the ultimate and final WCW champion, very similar to what I did in night one, where I had a three-way dance to determine who is the final ECW champion. This is a match to crown the final WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Now, ideally, you know, I, this match would have been filled with, like, bigger, more iconic WCW names like Goldberg or Sting and, and guys like that. I mean, Luger I would put in that class. Booker I would put in that class. DDP is definitely in that class. But, you know, I use them in other matches. So I used eight, and I think Perry Saturn is massively underrated, so I, I'm more than happy to give him a, a spot here. Dean Malenko, of course, amazing worker. Chris Benoit, very talented individual, and we will leave it at that. <laughs> we will. I divorce again. Separating the art, the art from the artist, is something I've had to do a lot in professional wrestling, and Chris Benoit might be the ultimate example of that. But uh, in any case, uh, yeah, this is a match designed to crown the final WCW champion. Who would I give it to? Either Booker or DDP. Uh, probably Booker, just to keep the you know the the mystique I built in my mind that he was the true final WCW champion. So that's what I would go with. Next up is a match I would consider to be the ultimate hardcore match. A barbed wire match between the lunatic fringe John Moxley and the king of the death match, Cactus Jack, Mick Foley. Um, I mean, it practically writes itself, right? I mean, you've got two of the most violent wrestlers of all time. Uh, guys that love blood, love guts, love barbed wire, love all that stuff. Explode, yeah, have fire, have, you know, everything blow up. Do whatever they want. Just have the ultimate hardcore match between two talents that are crazy enough to pull something like that off. Um, yeah, again, it's a situation that kind of writes itself, so I don't really have to elaborate on, on it too much more. I would have Cactus Jack go over because I'm a Foley mark, but uh, yeah, this could, if you like Blood and Guts Hardcore Wrestling, this would be the ultimate version of that. And next up is a 10-man Survivor Series tag team match. It's the last one, I swear. But this one has the theme of the wrestling legends versus the celebrities, the outsiders. So I cooked out... So really, I focused on getting wrestlers who were more, like, pre-WrestleMania fame. Like, guys that made a name for themselves before the era of WrestleMania that somehow managed to have a match at WrestleMania despite uh, kind of being a little bit older than the event. Uh, and there's actually quite a handful of guys that achieved that. Um, Jerry the King Waller had a match at WrestleMania 27. It was a horrible match, but he had one. Uh, Bob Backlund had a couple of WrestleMania matches. Pedro Morales was in the WWF NFL Battle Royal at WrestleMania 2, so I used him. Uh, Dory Funk Jr. wrestled at WrestleMania 2, so I used him. And Harley Race had a couple of WrestleMania matches at 3 and 4. So uh, that's my old school blood and guts wrestling veteran team going up against the celebrities who have wrestled at WrestleMania. Team Captain Logan Paul, who of course is, you know, as far as talent goes, the greatest celebrity wrestler of all time. Uh, Bad Bunny. Floyd Money Mayweather, Lawrence Taylor, uh, former New York Giant Lawrence Taylor, and the original celebrity wrestler, Mr. T. And it's going to be the wrestling legends versus the celebrities. I would have the, because I'm a wrestling fan, I would have the wrestlers just absolutely destroy them and uh, have it come down to like a, a five-on-one against Logan Paul and let him get beat up and let Lawler put him away with a pile driver. That's what I would do. But, um, you know, let's have some fun with it. But uh, yeah, something like this, it's... It, it, you know, when you do the whole, like, tradition versus kind of more rebellious outsider spirit or something like that, uh, I think it would make for really good chemistry, and I think it would make for a really fun match. So this is something I cooked up that I thought would just be a lot of fun. And now we're getting into the big ones, like the really, really big ones. Uh, for the, the Ultimate Intercontinental Championship, it's a battle between two men who I consider to be two of the greatest Intercontinental Champions of all time. The Macho Man Randy Savage... The original, in my opinion, the original Mr. WrestleMania, because he was the one, even though Hogan was drawing the crowds, he was the one stealing the show on those early WrestleManias. Uh, specifically three. Uh, definitely seven was another one where he did that, and uh, you know he main-evented four and five, with good reason, because uh, he was just that damn good. 
and he would go up against the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels, uh, specifically the 97 Shawn Michaels. That would be, even though Shawn was past the Intercontinental title level at that point, um, I, this would be an amazing matchup. And I think, you know, a real Randy Savage versus Shawn Michaels program would have been really good. I know it's one that Savage wanted to do and ultimately got shot down um, in the early 90s. They did have some matches on the house show circuit and things like that. Um, they were pretty good, the ones that I've seen. But I think on a grand stage like WrestleMania, with both guys working at their very best level, I think you could have had an amazing match between these two. And um, one again, it's one of those matches I would have absolutely gone out of my way to see, for sure. And who goes over? I mean, I'm, I'm a Randy Savage, Mark. I'm, I love Sean, but Randy's my... Sean is in my top five, Randy's my number one. It's the same thing I said about the Bulldogs and Steiners. Like, look, Bulldogs are in my top five, but Steiners are my number one, and I feel that way about Randy. Randy's my number one, so I would have him go over, and I'm a selfish jerk in that regard. So, uh, but yeah, this match would be amazing. And of course, you gotta have a little bit of comedy in there. It can't all just be star ratings and blood and guts and all that other fun stuff. It's okay to have a little bit of comedy in there, and some managers have worked matches at WrestleMania in the past, which allowed me to cook up this little, uh, this little doodad here. The Battle of the Managers, a triple threat match. Bobby Heenan, who worked a couple of the early WrestleManias, specifically four and five. Uh, Mr. Fuji, who had a match at WrestleMania five. And Jim Cornette, who was part of the gimmick Battle Royal at, at WrestleMania 17. Um, this would be fun for the personalities involved and whatever kind of kooky comedy spots they could uh, deliver on. Uh, Mr. Fuji, being more of the martial arts type of guy, could have fun like torturing Cornette, I think. I And Heenan and all sorts of things. And actually, I think back to when I was a kid, they were actually teasing a feud uh, between Bobby Heenan and Mr. Fuji in 91, which looked like they were going to turn Bobby into a pseudo face. It didn't really pan out. They never really uh, completed that story because Bobby stepped away from managing. But had they done that, I would have fully been on Bobby Heenan's side. Like, no question. It, like Bobby was one of those guys that even though he was a heel, I loved him. And I loved watching him get his comeuppance. But if they ever did a storyline where they turned Bobby face and they didn't do anything to water him down, I would have been on his side so fast, it would have been ridiculous. Like, and some heels are that way. I was that way with The Undertaker, where he was a heel, but I was like, man, he's cool. The second they turn him face, he's going to be my favorite wrestler. And sure enough, they did, and he became my favorite wrestler. So, um... But Bobby was always somebody that I loved, admired, and um, <coughs> I would even, like, if this match were to ever happen, I would have Gorilla Monsoon train him for the match, because, come on, that would be gold. I was, oh my god, the amount of things they could have done with something like this, but um, Bobby was a treasure. Bobby was an absolute treasure, so if you can't tell by my fawning over him, I would have absolutely had Bobby Heenan go over in this match, because he's he's the man. He's the weasel, he's the brain, and he's the man. I, I love Heenan to death, and uh, this, another, I already gave him a, a triple threat amongst his, like, diamonds, you know, and his uh, crown jewels and everything, but I, I wanted to give him another kind of showcase match to really, really put him over the top, because I just love Bobby Heenan that much. And now we're going for pure spectacle, pure attraction, uh, Battle of the Giants, Battle of the Phenoms, however you want to put it. But this is something that, I, again, it wouldn't be the most athletically sound match of all time, but the, the appeal of the visual of seeing these two talents together is what would draw people to see it and seeing what they would do with each other. And that is two of the most unbeatable figures in WWF history, two of the biggest attractions in WWF slash E history, Andre the Giant, the eighth wonder of the world, versus the Phenom, the Lord of Darkness, the Undertaker. Um, I, I mean, I again, we talk about matches that you would throw your money at. I, As a kid or as an adult, if this match ever took place, I would have thrown my money at it. And knowing full well, it's like, look, I know Andre has his limitations, especially later in life when his health problems got in the way, but it's like, it's not about that. It's about the spectacle and like, what on earth are they gonna do with each other? What can Undertaker do to the Giant? And you know, Undertaker has experience working with the great Kali's and the Giant Gonzalez's of the world. Matches that, quite honestly, I did not hate. I'm sure for Undertaker, they were like pulling teeth, but me personally, I didn't, I, I kind of enjoyed those matches, uh, you know, on a kind of a minimalist level, a pure spectacle level, I kind of enjoyed them. Uh, but you put him in there with Andre, Andre who's got a smart mind for the business and knows what he's doing and knows how to make people look good and can determine when he's not going to make people look good. I, I think Andre and Undertaker would have been a very fascinating pairing and one that uh, would have been highly enjoyable. And hey, you know, you get like 83 Andre in there with 
98 Undertaker? Like, because that was like my personal favorite Undertaker and Andre was probably like towards the end of his physical prime at like 80, 83 or so. You put them together, you'd probably have one hell of a match. I watched uh, Big John Studd and Andre the Giant have a cage match that was awesome. It had one of the scariest finishes I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, you could put that Andre in the ring with the Undertaker, you could have a hell of a match, I think. And uh, it's this is definitely an exciting one to think about. And finally, the main event of Night 3 and the ultimate main event of Fantasy Mania. It's an obvious one. You could have seen this one coming a mile away, but it's the ultimate WWF match. It's Hulk Hogan, the immortal one, arguably the greatest WWF champion of all time, going up against the Texas Rattlesnake, the toughest son of a bitch in the world, and the other candidate for arguably being the greatest WWF champion of all time, and that is Stone Cold Steve Austin, the Lord of the Attitude Era versus the icon of the 80s and the rock and wrestling period. I mean, it, it's a match that, again, if they had ever done it, like, I, I would have thrown money at it because it's like, God, I want to see these two go at it. Um, how would Austin react to Hogan hulking up? Like, what would that even look like? Because uh, I'm picturing, like, Austin hits the stunner and Hogan no-sells it and starts hulking up and, and all sorts of different things that they could do with each other. It's it's a fascinating match to think about. It would have been a huge moneymaker like if they'd done it um, in 98 or in 2005, uh, you know, at, at any point. But it's, um, it's definitely a fun match to think about. And it's one that, uh, you know, you want to talk about dream matches. This is one that will be talked about forever as being one of the... Uh, one of those dream matches that that uh, we never got, and uh, you know it's up there with Taker and Sting. It's up there with uh, Andre and Undertaker. Is like one of those dream matches that just didn't happen. This is one for me, where and for a lot of people, it's Hulk Hogan and Stone Cold Steve Austin. What could have been? What could have been indeed? But that wraps up Fantasy Mania. Hopefully you all enjoyed that, and I hope you all enjoy WrestleMania 40 this weekend. It's a big year for WrestleMania. Big milestone for the event. Um, uh, I mean, the first WrestleMania happened 11 days after I was born, so I've literally grown up with WrestleMania, and to see all the peaks and valleys uh, throughout the storied history of the event, it's amazing, and to see that it's reached 40 shows is even more amazing. So uh, here's hoping for a great show this weekend, two great shows this weekend, and a lot of great matches and memories. Uh, the stuff that WrestleMania can provide when... Um, when uh, they do everything right. So here's hoping. And I'll be watching the show with a lot of intrigue and excitement. So uh, yeah, here's, here's hoping for two great shows. But that is all I have for you now. Thanks again, everybody, for watching. And I will see you all later.